Okay, so before we start, I have uh, just a couple of questions. Um, for example, um, who is using Blender in this room? Okay, that's, that's good. So I'm in the right place, okay. Um, then uh, who is a student? Who is studying, studying university, high school, whatever, okay? And uh, who is um, a, a professional who is using Blender for work? For Okay, well, it's a great uh, balance. So and somebody is a student and doing professional work with Blender. Someone. <coughs> yeah, one. Yeah, good. Two. Um, okay, uh, and then who is who considers himself more like um, a tech user? So a person with a, with a good technical knowledge of how uh, software programming works, who, are, who uses Blender for doing technical things, not necessarily like scientific research stuff, but like who, who does the TD job, sort of. So not many people, okay, okay. All right, so that was just to, to have an idea, you know, if, uh, uh, just, just to have an idea for me, so now I can invent my presentation right now. Um, basically, uh, to give you an overview, the, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about is going to be split in uh, two or three parts, depending on how much time we have. And uh, the first part is going to be about um, the making of um, Tears of Steel in 4K, which is something Sebastian mentioned before. And uh, the second part is going to be about the making of another short animated uh, film I made uh, together with uh, uh, three other people. It's, it's called Caminandes. I don't know if anyone has seen it already, but uh, I'm going to show you. It's a very short movie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how we did that. And then if there is time left and uh, you are interested, we can also have a very little session with some uh, tricks and some tips about production management. Uh, which is not, uh, maybe it sounds boring to you because maybe you're all like people who want to work and they don't want to really manage uh, other people doing work, but uh, uh, actually it's about how to organize yourself when you do a project with, uh, with Blender and how to be efficient and how to actually save time and be more productive. So if you're interested and there is time left, maybe we can also talk about that. Um, so, um, Tears of Steel. Uh, I think uh, everyone has seen it at, the, at least once now, maybe more than once. You have actually seen the uh, downscaled version of the 4K uh, movie that was just rendered a couple of days ago. Uh, after a period of uh, around three months of work uh, that uh, I did um, together with uh, uh, Pablo Vasquez in uh, Amsterdam. And, uh, Basically, this is a little story about how we did it. So uh, these are the Tears of Steel DVDs that were shipped after the production was made. So after we finished Tears of Steel and we put it in uh, uh, a thousand little envelopes and sent it all over the world, we said, yeah, well, now we just need to redo it again and make it bigger. That's what you do, right? And. Um, the idea is, uh, as you can see here, to make a 4K uh, Ultra uh, HD. That's the more commercial name. Maybe you've heard about that. Um, so uh, is anyone, uh, you all know what 4K is, right? I guess, yes. And uh, you know that, um, so th this is the, you see my arrow, yeah? So this is the format we did, the, the, the original format we worked with, and then this is the one we were targeting. So as you can see, there is a considerable amount of more stuff to, to deal with. And um, nowadays, uh, it's getting more and more interesting because uh, the first uh, commercially uh, viable products are appearing on the market. So there is a growing interest in also uh, hardware producers to, for, to have content that can be displayed on this. And people can actually buy for less than 10,000 euros uh, a TV. So it's getting, it's getting more and more interesting. Because also, uh, you know, also Sintel maybe, uh, the, the, the previous uh, open movie, that was also done in 4K, but it was really hard to show it because uh, yeah, there, there was no place to show it besides an uh, IMAX cinema, high resolution projector. So um, the main players involved in the, in the production of the, 
of this uh, 4K version, where uh, Cinegrid Amsterdam, the Blender Institute, and Rovi Corporation, who uh, provided the funds for uh, working on uh, on this uh, on this production. And uh, this is just uh, something uh, interesting to know. Um, uh, how, and it's still about how we got started with this, uh, how, how it was possible in the first place to do a 4K version uh, of uh, Tears of Steel, because as you know, uh, Tears of Steel is not an, uh, only computer graphics, but is uh, also uh, with um, uh, live footage. So we needed the footage to be at least very high resolution. And as Sebastian said already, the, the native sensor of the camera was shooting 8K, and then it was downscaled to uh, 4K. So actually we had that great 4K plates that we could use. And those plates are so great that even the foundry, you know, the people who make Nuke, uh, have been using this footage for demoing uh, features of Nuke. So if you, uh, you find on the, on, the, on the web, this uh, website is called uh, Step Up to Nuke. So it's giving an introduction of how Nuke works, but they are using our awesome 4K footage to do, in this case, is a, a keying example, as you can see. So uh, we had this, this, this great footage and uh, basically there is very little material on the market available at this resolution. So uh, what we did uh, was a kind of uh, groundbreaking, like releasing uh, all this very high resolution footage uh, to the public and also releasing a post-produced uh, version of the footage at this resolution. And uh, just to go over our project targets, basically they were, as I said already, to re-render the movie. Uh, which sounds easy, but uh, maybe not necessarily. So that's something I'm going to talk about. And uh, the target was also like uh, the distribution. How do you give a person a 4K movie? How does it work? Uh, 4K is not, uh, I mean, where do you watch it and how, and, and these kind of uh, topics. And uh, also how, like, get Blender to support uh, 4K rendering. Um, in a human way. This means, um, of course, if you, if you work with in, a, in a HD resolution and it takes you uh, five minutes to go through a composite once uh, you have rendered the film, <coughs> being the 4K version uh, four times more, the HD, and that, then it's going to take the 20 minutes to get an image done. And that's, that's not very nice. It can take you four times the amount of time. So we had to figure out some, uh, some solutions to, to deal with that. And uh, also about, uh, for example, the distribution and the viewing. How do you view? How do you check the quality of your frames? Um, so th there were a, a lot of targets and a lot of challenges at the same time. So uh, to go through some of the other challenges, uh, um, we can mention uh, the, the consistency. So uh, in the, between the release of the movie, Tears of Steel, and the start of the new project, a new version of Blender was uh, developed. And uh, Blender is uh, great because it's very retro compatible. So you know what this means. You can get Blender 2.67 and open a file from Blender 2.3, and it's going to work. That's awesome, right? Except that it looks like it's working, but uh, behind the scenes, many things are being handled and uh, not all of them are being handled correctly. So depending on the complexity of the file you're gonna open, this can also be a very big failure and uh, you might not even realize until you are in the middle of your work already. So this is not so dramatic, but uh, just to make an example, when we started doing the um, 4K version, um, a very big uh, refactor, a very big uh, work uh, was just completed on the compositor so that Blender could treat alpha, alpha channel, uh, uh, better, in a smarter way, more consistent across the whole system. But the whole Tears of Steel production was done with a Blender that treated the alpha in the previous way. So very mixed up, a little bit hacky, not very clear sometimes. So this meant that I had to spend one or two weeks just making sure that these files would uh, actually work and look the same when they were re-rendered in the new Blender. And uh, that was sometimes very difficult to figure out why, because, well, the composite setups were not so easy to, to debug. You are talking about setups with like a 100, 200 nodes, so you have to go through them and figure out. So that was one of the challenges. And uh, as I said before, have a faster and interactive uh, uh, pipeline 
this means that we had to figure out a way to not wait uh, one hour to get an image render, otherwise I would still be in Amsterdam doing the 4K version. So we figured out something, as you can see, because I'm here. Um, also, uh, um, a movie is never finished. Maybe you know that. If you work with Blender, you work with uh, art, you, you produce stuff. Usually what they say is uh, that the, the work is finished when they take it away from you, because otherwise you would keep on working on it forever. And that's more or less the same also for us. So there were some little things that would, uh, would be nice to fix, but we didn't have time in the first place. So that was the chance to actually fix some shots. And uh, also, given the, the massive upscaling, because like four times the detail means that if the detail is there, which most of the time was, uh, is great because you actually get the render and say, oh, I never noticed this, I never noticed this text. Actually, in the HD version, uh, you cannot see, but I have a couple of uh, uh, 4K frames, maybe we can, we can look at them. And you really see, you can read the text in the holograms, you can see the details in a texture, and that's something you would never see otherwise. And it was done in the first place, but it wasn't visible in the first version. In other cases, it's less nice, you see, oh, look at these giant polygon cubes that are there and we never saw before. So in that case, you have to fix it and yeah, you have to. Um, so we start talking about solution. So you need to see 4K uh, footage, you need to see 4K render. So what you do is uh, you pick four uh, HD monitors and you wire them together and then you have a 4K monitor. <laughs> Done. Very simple, right? If you have Tom Rosendahl uh, around, he's just gonna take four screens, put them together, and uh, then we take two crappy graphic cards because it doesn't really matter as long as they are identical and they, you, you just put a, a slide bridge and, uh, and then you can just view your 4K things. I mean, the scale of this, you know, this is a keyboard. So that, that thing was like this wide, you know, and this tall. And, and this was a handmade um, rig to keep them together. So it would even lean a little bit like this because it wasn't super sturdy. So like it would wobble a little bit. So you would want to finish very fast before it falls on you, you know? Um, <clears throat> so uh, actually to talk about more uh, uh, interesting like uh, practical solutions. Uh, again, uh, faster compositing workflow. What does it mean? I can, I can give you two examples. Uh, one example is uh, that we, uh, you can't, if, if a render takes five minutes, to make it four times bigger is gonna take 20. There is um, almost no way to change that, uh, and especially for the composite. But sometimes, most of the times, you don't really need to see uh, all the render, you just need to see a part. So uh, you are all familiar with the concept of border rendering, right? You can select an area and just say to Blender, render only in this area. Except that this in Blender didn't really work um, across the scenes, across different render layers. And uh, so we got that working. So now if you are working on a very big complex scene with uh, multiple LinkedIn scenes and render layers and you set a border render is actually going to work. And also what we got that we, we've, we've been asking for it forever and eventually for this type of job you, uh, you need it is a border composite. So if you are in the compositor, and you have this blender with the cube. We can maybe even get something more interesting. Uh, simple blend, scenes. Let's just open some stuff, okay? So if you render this frame, look at how fast it renders. So now it's compositing. I hope I didn't, okay. Ah, nine seconds. Because everything is rendered already, you don't want. We, we, this is just a demo file, so uh, you wish it was this fast. Now, actually, this is probably mostly actually rendered, but because these scenes were, the, the footage was pre keyed, and uh, as you can see, we only had these uh, holograms <coughs> being rendered. So, in this case, what you can do is you can uh, border render, and uh, so you draw a border, and then you're gonna only see this. And so that's perfect because then we can just work on this area and it's a million times faster. And we didn't have this, it's amazing, right? I mean, you would expect this to exist since <laughs> day one when you're working even on the HD version, but it wasn't there. 
So that was, uh, this is an example of something that we got. Um, composite, uh, a compositor inspection tool is also something interesting because what I had to do, uh, so I worked around three months on this project. Uh, most of the work consisted in uh, opening uh, composite files and uh, looking into them and uh, making sure that the, when I would set a new render resolution, everything would work. And uh, this is a very simple microscopic uh, composite setup. This one is also very simple. I think all the ones in the simple blends are pretty simple. But you have to imagine something like this, okay? You have this, usually is twice as much as this stuff, and uh, I didn't do it. Somebody else did, probably Sebastian. So uh, either I can uh, go on uh, IRC in a chat and ask, hey Sebastian, uh, how did you do this stuff? And he said, yeah, there is the third uh, mix node from the top and you have to change the alpha because, or you have to change the dilate erode node to three, one, yeah, awesome. And then, you know, this can be very complicated because you see a lot of complexity. And um, so one of the things we got that was uh, very nice is a uh, search for nodes. So you can actually control F and, and you can look for a node. So if I'm actually looking for dilate, erode, okay, there are four, but at least I know that there are four dilate erodes and I can go in one and here he is. And actually what I can do, unfortunately because of my uh, keyboard um, uh, 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 layout, I can't do it with the keyboard, but I have the operator here. I can actually go from one to the other and it navigates through the compositor. This is very handy, this makes you very fast because if Sebastian tells me, hey, there is the flare node, uh, okay, I can go through all the three flare nodes that are in the composition and I can actually do it in less than a second instead of doing this all my life, you know? So this is an example of uh, uh, inspection. This is very important because when you work with other people, uh, this always happens. This is very na natural. There is no way to prevent this, so you have to have tools that help you to go through it. Um, another uh, interesting uh, thing we got was uh, improvements in the uh, playback system for footage because we needed to review the footage. And we decided to review these uh, giant 4K frames directly in Blender using the uh, using the movie clip editor and uh, because of, of uh, the uh, prefetching, for example, it was very easy to load these giant frames because then they would be cached and they would play back very smoothly. And uh, at some point we also used the old Blender player, so some fixes were done to that. Because basically, yeah, on, on Linux there, was no really not, there wasn't really a player that would allow you to review uh, JPEG or uh, EXR frames in real time in 4K. So we decided to go with Blender, which is the typical approach when you work in the Blender Institute. If you need to do something, you usually use Blender. If you need to send an email, you usually, no, you, we don't use Blender for that. But, uh, but for some stuff, we do, uh, most of it. Um, Okay, and then another solution. I mean, this this is not directly to, uh, is not directly related to Blender, but this is a, a tool that I would like to mention because it's interesting if you work on productions. I needed to keep track of the 130 shots that were done uh, that, that that make up the movie because I needed to know which one I already did, which one was in progress, and so on. So during Mango already, I developed a little uh, web application which is called Attract. It's a free software. It's a very simple uh, PHP uh, little application that um, shows you all the shots of the film. You see, this uh, this is the Tears of Steel film. And uh, we, can, we can know the almost final seconds of the movie, because you never have the final seconds. They're almost final all the time. And uh, you can actually pick the status the movie is. You can actually have uh, comments and you can have an owner. You know the duration, so you can have some stats and know how much of the movie you've done and how much is pending. And uh, I made this little tool and uh, it's, it's available online for, uh, for free and you can download it and use it. So that was something like that didn't exist and I was wondering how it was done before, mostly with uh, uh, open office spreadsheets, but I think this is a little bit more a flexible solution. So I thought it was interesting to mention at least. Um, actually now, yeah, I think we can just uh, go on and uh, talk about the uh, distribution. So. This process of inspecting, upscaling, rendering, uh, 
this took about two and a half months, uh, more or less. And, uh, and then one of our challenges, as you remember, was how do we distribute it? So the first target we had was to uh, show the film on a 4K projector. So we wanted to, we, our first target was digital cinema. And does anyone, in, does anyone know how uh, digital cinema works? Like, who knows, can raise their hand? One person, two people, awesome. So I'm just going to give you a very quick, very super quick uh, in, in, intro on uh, digital cinema. It's interesting. Um, cinema used to work with film. You know that, right? You have a projector, you have the film, and you show, uh, you, you, you put light through the film and you show it on the screen, awesome. Uh, not anymore? Yeah, okay. Um, not anymore. Uh, now the process is digital. So basically uh, cinema projectors are like that projector that we have here, um, but they, they are a bit special because uh, the way they work um, the image format they use uh, and so on is, uh, has been designed by an international committee and it has been made a worldwide standard. So there is a, uh, there is a, a committee it's called the Digital Cinema Initiative. So it's uh, some people who drafted and defined some guidelines on how this has to be done. So there are specific formats, specific codecs, a specific way of preparing a movie so that it can be shown on a digital, projection, on a digital projector at a, a quality so high that you can mistake it for film, for an actual film. And that is the target. So to switch from the old way of printing and distributing to having a fully digital version of the same movie with all the advantages that digital distribution has. And this is uh, something that belongs to the uh, industry, the cinema industry, Hollywood. And you know that Hollywood is not really so fun of, uh, so fond of uh, open source and open standards and so on. Uh, the digital cinema initiative uh, is actually open, so the specification for this are public, and this can be done by anyone. But in practice, it's not really like that. So, uh, in order to approach and do. Uh, digital distribution for cinema, we had to go through a little bit of struggle, and I'm, that's what I'm telling you right now. Um, what we did, uh, the, the, the product we did is called a DCP, it's called a Digital Cinema Package, and uh, this is the, it's a, a container uh, that uh, is made of uh, um, high resolution images, high resolution, high quality sound, it's packed together with some uh, XML files, and then you put this little box into the digital cinema projector and magically it shows the movie uh, and it's great. And um, in order to make this, um, we had to set up a pipeline um, that would allow us to monitor this content that we were going to do because um, um, given the very high quality of the final product, it wasn't possible for us to show it in the studio. We had to go to a cinema with a cinema projector to test it. So how do you test it before? And here you have a little example, I don't want to bore you too much, but just to give you an idea of how this has to work. We had to render, in the end, the uh, 4K uh, TIFF images at 16 bits. So if you want to do a little bit of math, you know that a TIFF, one frame of the film was a 50 gigs, uh, 50 megs, pardon, 50 megabytes. We had uh, 17,626 frames. And uh, I can do the math for you. It's uh, 860 gigabytes of uh, images for 12 minutes of uh, film. So it's quite a lot. So that, that one was taking a, a long time to write and read from the disk, you know. Um, so we had to make this giant archive. And then this giant archive of images, this giant sequence, has to be converted to specific formats. In this case, the uh, JPEG 2000 with a special color profile. And this is what gets wrapped up into a, uh, another, into a container that makes this digital cinema package. And this is something we cannot watch, we cannot preview. So what we had to do was to make low resolution JPEGs and make a MOV and then mix it with the sound 
uh, of course, because we always work, you know, images and sound separate. And also to make the same with the JPEGs, to make sure that there were no lost frames, corrupted images, and that kind of stuff. And errors, always errors. Like, why does this robot intersect the wall? Why did anyone notice this? And we are one day to final distribution and we notice that there is a robot. Well, let's hope nobody notices. <laughs> and um, that kind of stuff. So it's very useful for this. So eventually, um, we, we managed to do this and we've been documenting the process. So if you want to know a little bit more about this, uh, you can actually check the mango.blender.org website. Maybe, I mean, if you know the, the, the Tears of Steel, probably you are aware of also how the open movie was made. So you know that there is a blog and so you can check that blog and there is an article about that if you ever want to know more. Um, and this is actually uh, the most glorious moment when uh, our uh, movie was being imported by the digital cinema server in the theater and it was actually working. So that's uh, how the interface of the digital cinema system works, uh, looks when you are importing a movie. Um, let me just see uh, something, just a moment. Um, okay, are there any questions about this? About 4K compositing uh, problems that you have with Blender doing 4K? Have, has anyone tried to do 4K? Work out of the box. Which box? <laughs> Blender. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, external tools on the uh, end line, uh, or you can make uh, the package. Can you make the package out of the? Ah uh, no no! In order to make a to make a digital cinema package, you need uh, other external tools. But uh, uh, no, so how, you can. How, how far can we get? How far uh, just using the blender? So I mean, when when, uh, when when there is this moment, you have to switch, switch. and use some. Well, yeah, at some point you have to because this is not something Blender is expected to do. But uh, you can go up to making the JPEG two thousand images. At the moment, there are still some problems, but the idea is that you can do that. And this potentially saves you having 800 gigabytes of images that then you have to convert later on into JPEG 2000. So that's the, like, if Blender manages to get to that point, uh, then it's great. There is nothing more to do, actually. Yeah. This uh, software PHP organizer that you showed, uh, uh, does it uh, work also with the render farm? I mean, this progress bar or status, does, um, it, does it communicate with the uh, render farm, for example? Yeah, not yet. Um, I'm working on a better solution. Like, that was a very quick implementation. I did it, like, in a couple of days, no, in one week, okay? Um, so it's very rough. But the idea is to have some sort of tool that helps you to keep synchronized your renderings and your progress and so on, because... Um, you, you usually need that. And there is no open source tool doing this. Uh, there is a very popular tool that is called Shotgun. Maybe you've heard of it. It's, uh, it's uh, everywhere. And uh, it's one of the industry standard tools. But um, there is no open source solution. So I think it's nice to look into it. OK. Um, at this point, um, I would like to show you very briefly some uh, uh, cute uh, animation very very short and then we can have a quick chat about it and then uh, we can go and have lunch because i don't want to see you fainting here but you can you can hold on for like 10 minutes still right five ten minutes it's okay okay you can also just go away i mean <laughs> okay so coming on this uh, has anyone uh, seen it well you're gonna watch it again um and here it is. Uh, I hope there is sound. Well, let's let's find out.
Thank you. So, how we did that? It was, as you've, as you've seen, it's four people. Three artists, like three uh, computer uh, graphics uh, artists, and one composer, one musician. We did this in uh, around two, three weeks. Um, so this is the three guys in the Blender uh, Institute, because we were just uh, coincidentally there. And uh, I said, um, well, let's make a short film. No, I mean, if you have Pablo Vasquez, you know Pablo, right? And uh, you have Bjorn, Bjorn Leonard. He has been doing a lot of uh, training tutorials. They both have been working on Sintel. They are awesome. So like if I'm there, I tell them, guys, let's make a movie because you are so good. Like, I can just uh, hang out with you while you make the movie. And then, <laughs> <laughs> so then you see, like I sit in front of the computer, so it looks like I'm doing something, but actually it's the two of them doing everything. You see, see? So this is uh, when the, 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 the llama, the, the guanaco is spinning around and falling. Um, okay, so uh, how we did it, um, basically, I'm just going to tell you a little bit the story, just, uh, just uh, for fun. Um, we, we were there, so we decided to do it, and uh, in a couple of days, we developed the, the story, the story concept is pretty simple. So it's not that we spent like one month in a cottage in the woods uh, thinking philosophically. Uh, we've just been saying, okay, he should uh, have a, at, at some point he wanted to cross the road because he wanted to get something on the other side of the road, but that was a bit too forced and we had to show something and in the end it wasn't needed because as you can see, the story works anyway. It's just fun that he's trying and failing and then the, the armadillo is coming and he just, you know, doesn't care. Um, so the, the something we had before, though, were the characters. The characters existed already because they have been designed by Pablo Vasquez for his uh, um, Venom Slab 2 uh, character creation uh, DVD uh, from the Blender Foundation. If you are not familiar with this product and you want to improve your skills as a character designer and in, and in general as a uh, CG generalist, I highly recommend this. Uh, it's, it's for a good cause because this is produced by the Blender, by the Blender Institute. So uh, it's very, very good quality. And, and in the end, basically, Pablo is teaching you how to make this guy and the Armadillo too, but mainly this guy. So it's very interesting. And we had that. So we said, okay, let's, let's use these characters to do something. Um, also because the, the way that the license of this product is also uh, is a Creative Commons buy, so there were no problems in using it. And also the uh, coming under a short film, by the way, is a, a Creative Commons uh, buy. Um, so after uh, deciding that we wanted these two guys and we wanted the story to happen, we had to start previsualizing. So this, as you will see, is a pattern very similar to what Sebastian just told a couple of hours ago. So I'm not going to be very slow uh, uh, telling that. Uh, but basically, uh, we went through a storyboarding phase where we designed the shots, the cameras, uh, more or less. And uh, then we uh, moved forward to do animation. But before doing that, I'm actually going to show you just uh, briefly this. So just, uh, just a moment. Actually, no, I don't know. Maybe I even have it in the presentation later, but I'm just going to show you. So this is the short film, and these are some images from the storyboard. And as you can see, they match uh, quite a bit. So uh, this is just to, you see, to, to get an idea. You, you just need to be very rough, very simple. And, and we just said, yeah, and he's going to put the hoof close and then you hear the sound. And like, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's great. OK, let's do it. So <laughs> and it, I mean, it kind of works. So so we have the armadillo and he, he doesn't stop ever, never. And so then this giant hit. So we had to do some trials to build up the right combination of uh, how much tension you, you know, how many times it's going to try to cross and so on. So in the, in, thanks to the tools that Blender offers, that is like to build, uh, to, to build basic scenes uh, containing your characters and some rough animations, then you can do some editing 
in, in Blender to, to change the timing, to change the cuts and to have an idea of how it's going to look like. So this helps a lot because now this is a really a version of the storyboards almost cut to fit the final shots. They were not maybe arranged exactly like this. But as you can see, the general design is there. So um, the, I, I'm going to quickly um, show you some uh, uh, material we used for our animation, animation reference, that kind of uh, stuff. For, uh, and then uh, I'm going to walk you through a shot just to have a look of how, how it is in Blender. And then, uh, and then uh, just uh, we are going to probably to wrap it up. When you do, does anyone do character animation here with Blender, with anything? Few people, okay, but uh, okay. Does anyone want to learn to know character animation? Like who wants to, to know more? Okay, <laughs> so I, I mean, you are, you are familiar with how the animation process works more or less, but um, uh, the very first step, the very important one, after you've been defining already what's going to happen, but like to get into the animation process is you need reference. So you need to, to see what the character you're going to animate is going to do more or less. So when you, when, whoa, okay, we don't need the sound for this. Um, so we, uh, it's the best part because then you have to look for reference of these cute little animals. And then you just spend half a day on YouTube looking at this guy <laughs> and he's like well yeah hmm i guess i'm gonna dig some holes and then i'm gonna dig some more holes here and then well okay you got the idea um but this is this is the best this the, uh, i'm talking about animation reference just because i want to show you this uh, this this movie actually <laughs> so these are the uh, these are called well, ah, no this is so bad these are called guanacos and they are wild uh, llamas okay you know llama maybe this is actually a guanaco so they are similar and they look funny right but the best part is when a llama falls see <laughs> it's fallen <laughs> He's trying so hard. Ah, man, so hard. Ah, it's really hard for him. So, yeah, I mean, okay, in the end he manages, but uh, it was just, uh, it was just, uh, come on, I mean, uh, this, this is the best part uh, of the whole. For me, it was one of the highlights of, the, of this production. Um, besides that, you need to look up reference. So this is, uh, you know, Muy Bridge probably is a guy who was documenting uh, with photography at the very beginnings of photography how uh, animals move. And just for the record, uh, guanaco doesn't move like a horse because uh, uh, guanaco is more like a camel. So the way they move their legs is different than the way horses are moving them. So this image is actually wrong. But uh, we realized that when we were looking up for reference, because you would assume that he walks in one way, and then you look better and you say, no, this doesn't look the same, so you do it different. Um, so once you have done uh, uh, your research, then you can start setting up uh, your actual production uh, uh, files, your, your work. So basically what we are going to do now is walk through a shot. And uh, the way we uh, organize shots, probably you are familiar with it because you have seen other open movies. Maybe you've been reading up about how open movies were made and uh, we use the more or less the same structure. So we have a series of shots. These are all the shots we did. And, um, and inside of a shot, you have different blend files. This is a bit complicated, like we have more than one because we split them up. Uh, we have an animation file, we have a compositing file, a dynamics file, and a layout file. And uh, we usually start with a layout file. So this is a place where, the, where the, all the material that makes up a scene is placed. So as you can see, this is a fairly complicated, uh, well, fairly complicated is a set with uh, our character inside and that he's gonna be animated already, but that's because we are, this is a finished blend file. At the beginning, you don't have an animated guy, it's just standing there. But at least when you look through the camera, you know that it's gonna look like this. And then we have uh, the cars, we have the road and everything, and all this stuff is coming from somewhere else. So this is just a place where we put files together. 
You are probably all familiar with this way of working, right? Yes. I see some eyes closing <laughs> and falling now. Okay, but this is a, a layout file, so now you know for who who didn't know. And then uh, another important file is the animation file. So this is actually how we animated this, because this file, as you can see, works very fast. It plays back in real time, 24 frames per second, because everything is very low resolution, very simple. And, uh, and that's how an animator wants to work. Because if we try to open the other guy, like uh, this, and we try to play back, it's just playing back at four frames per second, which is not ideal, you know? So we do the animation in another file, and then uh, something else that is interesting is, uh, you've, you might not have noticed, but uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, this, oops, so here, for example, there are some shots, you see, when the cars are passing by, the, the grass is moving. Ah, who saw that? <laughs> I don't have a free uh, mouse to give to <laughs> who sees it, but... Uh, um, but we had a dynamics file for doing that, especially, you see, so you have the grass here, and then the grass is gonna move whew, with the sound effect. And uh, so we did that in a separate file because, of course, for technical reasons, you know, you, you, want to, you want to have control, you want to have a simple scene. So then all this comes together, as you might have guessed, in the comp file. And uh, this is uh, how the comp tree works, how the comp tree looks like. This is all work done by Pablo. Pablo worked mostly on uh, lighting and rendering and shading of the shots. Uh, Bjorn worked uh, exclusively on uh, character animation and I also worked a little bit on the character animation but as I told you I was just uh, hanging out with them because they were cool, you know. So uh, in this case you see that the composite setup is uh, also fairly simple, is organized in a way that we have background and the dynamics and we combine them together. And then we have our Coro character with some operations done on it. And then we had some, this is just for fixing issues, you know, because we had uh, problems of uh, particles and intersections. So this is just, uh, we don't care about it too much. And then we have the smoke, smoke plates. We didn't have, we, we made our smoke simulations separately. We made them into plates. So as you can see here, this is an image sequence and uh, we just pipe them in, in the composite sequence and then we render it. So it's pretty straightforward and everything comes together. And still, like if you render this file, this takes around 10 minutes, uh, five minutes, and uh, the frame from Caminandes comes out. So this is uh, uh, roughly how we've been setting this up. And we did that for all the other files. And then we have an edit uh, final, of course. And uh, this is where the movie comes together. So where the rendered uh, files are being um, collected and uh, put in a sequence with the sound and uh, cuts and uh, effects and every, anything that is needed for the edit and the final export and out of this blind file we actually get the movie. Before having these images uh, we had something similar to what Sebastian showed us before. We had our 3D scenes to look into and that way it's very nice as I already said to check out timing and change edits, put cuts, take out cuts, and so on. And uh, I think, uh, well, this is, I think, an overview. Just uh, one more thing to mention about this. So Caminandes is, uh, we, we've finished, we've released it online, is available, you can download it. Please share it with, uh, with uh, your friends and family. And uh, especially little kids, they like it very much. And, um, I, I think you also enjoyed it, um, so I think it's okay. Um, the next thing is uh, we might, uh, I, I might uh, uh, make a stereoscopic version of this because uh, in Blender now, I don't know if you are aware, but a developer, Dalai Felinto, is working on the implementation of uh, stereoscopic features in Blender. So it's gonna be possible to have stereo workflow. And uh, my goal for the next months, if I have time and uh, like uh, if the tools work out nicely is to make a stereo version of this. So you might see that around too at some point. Um, I think maybe we can have a couple of questions if you, if you want and then we can wrap it up. Are there any questions? Yes? Look, I'm even going to give you the microphone. 
Uh, you've shown us much about the workflow and how the uh, linking and grouping and uh, appending things work, uh, but I found a very big problem about finding some documentation or just information of what is really linked and where and is it linked and why do I have to animate my shape keys in the original file where I created them and I cannot... You know, this kind of stuff. Where would you point me uh, towards? Because the wiki of Blender is uh, really not sufficient in this uh, topic. Where would you point uh, people like me? I would point you to, uh, well, depends on how much detail you want. But if you've been looking in the Blender, in the wiki documentation, you've been actually looking in the right place. And if something is uh, not uh, available there, maybe you can try to ask uh, well, if it's something really technical, more related to the software, you can actually ask the developers. There is a mailing list where you can ask for, well, before writing to a mailing list, there is a chat where you can actually talk to people. And um, and you can figure, like, you, you can try to see if it's really like a technical problem, problem with Blender, if it's really like a lack of documentation because some features are not documented, or if it's just a workflow. Because if it's a workflow, um, it's normal that not everything is available out there like a lot of work is done by open movies like uh, tears of steel or Sintel to spread knowledge on how this is done but besides that uh, there are hundreds of production using these tricks and developing solution and not sharing them mostly because i mean partly because it's know-how that you develop as a company or as a studio maybe you don't you don't want to share it but also because you don't really have time to go on the blender wiki and explain your workflow so maybe I would ask around, uh, maybe to users, you can ask uh, to people who you know have been doing that and ask them for tips. And if you think it's really technical, then you can also go and talk to developers and say, why isn't this available? Or why isn't this documented? And then they say, yeah, go ahead and document it yourself. That's <laughs> usually, what, <laughs> that's usually what, you, what you get. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. One more question. Yeah. See? You said that there were only three of you making this uh, shot. So simple question would be within three hour, three weeks, yes? Yeah. Uh, how many man hours it came into each second of the movie? Mm, I would say, uh, well, it's uh, one and a half. And uh, um, we were three. <laughs> and uh, I have no idea. I have to make the calculation. Yeah. I'm questioning. I'm questioning you about it because I'm. I'm sometimes hearing stories about uh, guys making those films, yeah. and they're telling about sitting inside a dark room for weeks without yeah. breaks. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, uh, Amsterdam is pretty dark. <laughs> So no, I mean, um, when it's sunny, it's nice. No, but I mean, besides uh, Amsterdam, um, well, we've been keeping a healthy uh, life balance while doing this. Um, the production went uh, really smoothly because of we had these um, most of the assets, like the characters and also part of the environments were already available to us. So. This was uh, reasonably, reasonably fast because of that. The animation came together pretty quickly in uh, around uh, one, two weeks, but also because the animation is uh, fairly, like uh, it's a choice, like to keep fairly simple, direct animation. We were two people working on animation. So I think, I mean, mm, I, I, now you made me curious. I never calculated the man hours for this, but I can. I, I don't want to do it now with a calculator because maybe <laughs> it's embarrassing. I don't know math, so I can do it later and I can tell you. We can figure it out. Yeah. But uh, the idea is that this we we tried as a pro. This is an interesting product. It, this can be like a pilot for an animated series. So we wanted. We approached also maybe uh, we approached the studios to see if they could. They were interested in producing it, and the amount of time it takes is very important to them because doing something like this for industry standard uh, TV series production should be two weeks, more or less. So we are more or less into that time frame. But they outsource animation to Korea. We don't. That's different. Yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, the last question, and then uh, the best part, the lunch. <laughs> no last question? Oh, yeah, here. You can, oh. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Since you've been around in Amsterdam for the last couple of weeks or months, um, I would just like to ask you maybe do you know something about the Brenda conference this year? Yeah. Any word on days or uh, yeah. when the tickets are going to be available? Yeah. Um, well, the tickets, I think uh, the pre sale didn't start yet, but uh, the dates mm -hmm. are. Oh, I was checking a couple of days ago. Yes, but uh, uh, <laughs> blender.org. Because I think the, the news has been published uh, already. So community Blender conference and uh, Blender conference 2013. Oh, 25th. OK. This is the date. You see, it's 99.9% sure. 99. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's more or less the date. That's fine. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, yeah, well then, uh, thank you so much for your attention and your patience.